introduce Mr. Stephen Boyle. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, <laughs> please, save it for afterwards. Save it for afterwards. Okay, so I'm just going to introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I've been with Nationwide just under a year. Prior to that, uh, 26 years running fleets, mainly petroleum, um, refined fuel. A little bit of ag, but uh, mainly, mainly fuel. Uh, prior to that, jump, you know, jumped around a little bit, like, uh, like he was saying, uh, had, a, had, a, had a business for a little bit. That, that went under. Had a friend that was a truck driver, and he said, I can get you a job. So started out driving. Then I think they realized it was a little bit safer if they pulled me off the road and actually put me in the office. So this is my information. I'm a risk management consultant. What I do is I go out to customers of Nationwide. Uh, every three years, we do a full survey of that business and see if there's anything that we can do, anything that we can suggest, uh, any training that needs to be done, we will come out and do that, that training. And it's all part of the package. I'm not trying to sell Nationwide. I'm just telling you, tell you what I do. <clears throat> and then we also look at new, new businesses. And you know, we come out and, t and take a look. We are switching now to more, uh, I'm now losing that title and I'm going to become an occupational health and safety. So if a risk management comes out to your business and sees that maybe you have a fleet issue, then we need somebody that specializes in fleet, then I'll come out and we'll just talk about fleet. Uh, so that's, that's how nationwide it's changing. How many people here run fleets? Don't be shy. How many people don't run fleets? <laughs> fleet is uh, getting more complicated all the time. There are more rules and regulations. You know, we have new hours of service coming out. Uh, how many people here run a DOT number? Good, because we've got a little bit of crossover. All right? We've got uh, the DOT has their set of rules. California has their set of rules. So. It, if I get confused or if I start confusing people, it's because we have two different sets of rules that this state works by. It's, it's really annoying because we have all different hours of service. That's the disclaimer. Did everybody read that and make, make notes of it? Good. <clears throat> because that's going to tell you that everything I say hopefully is the truth but, and the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Everybody have a note paper? There is a test at the end of this. Make sure. Everyone looks worried as soon as I, I say test. What we're going to talk about is written fleet policies. If nothing else, if you fall asleep through this, <clears throat> but you walk out the door, the only thing you need to remember, hopefully you remember more than just the one thing, but the one thing is if you didn't document it, anybody know the answer? It didn't happen, all right? If the federal government comes in, they come knocking on your door, the DOT or the CHP every two years, and they say to you, show me the training for your hazmat drivers. And you pull out the hazmat. Here it is. Okay, great. Check it off. They're happy. You say, show me the training for the hazmat drivers. Well, we did it, but we didn't document it. It didn't happen. You can beg and plead all you want. It didn't happen. So... If nothing else, it's this bit right here. It's got to be written down. All right? Now, there's, there's a double-edged sword. If you write it down, you better have done it. If you write it down and say, this is our fleet policy, you better follow it. Because the attorney gets hold of that. Well, this is what you did. This is what you said you were going to do. And you didn't do it. All right? So it's a double-edged sword. CSA. Anybody familiar with CSA? Anybody check CSA? Anybody heard of CSA? One person. If you only have a CA number, a California number, and you only run within the state, a lot of people don't even know about this yet. The, the people with the DOT numbers are on this system. This is a federal system that tracks everything that truck, everything that company, everything that driver does. And it's available to the public. It's available to us. Before I come in to a trucking company, it's the first thing I do is I go onto the CSA website and see what the scores are, okay? California's been kind of uh, hiding over in the wings because if you don't have a DOT number, you're not on this system. Well, by the end of the year, you're going to be. 
Every uh, carrier with just a CA number on the door is going to have a ghost DOT number. And all of your scores are going to be on the federal website. So all your customers, all of your uh, people that do the same job as you, but charge different rates, are all going to be able to see what you're doing. Okay? So what I used to do, because I was running a DOT fleet, because we ran interstate, is I'd run a spreadsheet every, every month of the scores of all my com competitors. And when I went to Chevron or Shell or whoever and did bids, here's my safety scores, here's everybody else's safety scores. Do you want to pay a better rate to get your product there, or do you want to take the cheapest rate? And what do you think they did? Everybody awake yet? They usually took the cheapest rate, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Driver qualification file. It's the biggest thing. Okay, so I go into a fleet. Uh, Tuesday, I was in Gilroy, and I went into a fleet, 250 trucks, so about 500 drivers, because they run 24 hours a day. Maintenance was pretty good. Um, this is the biggest problem that I see everywhere, driver qualification files. So we're going to go into that a little bit. I find driver qualification files this thick and this thick. There's, there seems to be no happy medium. I, I've got copies of everything in, in some of them. Bid inspections. Everybody that runs a truck in this state is required to be in the bit program. Everybody knows what the bit program is. CHP comes out, has a donut, a cup of coffee, checks a few. Uh, yeah, I hear somebody laugh. Checks, checks a few things, and away they go. Right? The CHP are usually pretty good. They're pretty friendly. All the ones I've ever dealt with, I've been through a lot of bid inspections. I've never had confrontation. I have with the DOT. You got to be nice to the DOT because they come in, they knock on the door. You can legally turn them away. If they come in for a spot check, you can say, I'm sorry, I don't have time right now, close the door. And they'll make an appointment with you and come back, but the attitude is a little different then, right? you really got to be nice to those people. And drug and alcohol testing, everybody's the favorite. <clears throat> Just to kind of give an idea of where we need to go. And this is, obviously, it's a fleet management. So for the people that are looking after these issues, right? you may not be the one putting that file together. But when the CHP comes in or the DOT comes in, you're probably the one that's going to handle the file. Right? So it better be right. Fleet policies. So if, it didn't, if you didn't write it down, very good, very good, very good. It didn't happen. Cell phone. How many people have a cell phone policy in their driver? Very good, very good. Everybody hand should, everybody's hand should go up right now. Commercial drivers, if a commercial driver gets a uh, ticket, his ticket is $2,750 for using a cell phone. Okay? Cell phones. Everybody have a cell phone? I have a cell phone. Everybody on mute? Somebody always has it go off in the middle of these things. All right? <clears throat> so, now this is, remember, this is in a commercial vehicle. So if you're driving along in your own vehicle, it's, what, $159, I think? $2,750. I don't know many commercial drivers that can afford 2750 If you do not have a written policy stating your drivers are not allowed to use a cell phone unless it's hand, uh, hands-free, Bluetooth or whatever, that's the penalty. Can everybody see that? $11,000 goes to the company per incident. So if you get a a really happy officer that wants to pull over a few of your trucks and they're all on the phone, yours is going to add up real quick. Right? You need to have a written policy. And some of the reasons, Coca-Cola just got hit with a lawsuit for $27 million because their driver was on the phone, went in the back of somebody and killed him. And they didn't have a written policy. They're saying that he was not allowed to drive while on the phone. Right? And there's a case study that we're actually going to go through. For some reason, I don't know why, CBs are still fine. You can't sit there on the phone, but you can grab a mic and just the volume and talk and everyone else. Somebody paid, paid somebody off. Can everybody see this? Read this. This crew, there's a little, little, little kid here. This is why written policies are so important. And you can't write them and then file them. 
right? You've got to get them out. You've got to get everybody to know what the policies are. Their policy, this Pike utility, had a circle of safety. So whatever they were doing, before they got back in the truck, they'd walk around. They'd do this circle of safety, just to make sure everything's put away. Uh, I remember one time I was driving, I <coughs> had a set of doubles, and I'd parked, gone to got some uh, lunch, came back, and there was two people sitting on my drawbar in between the trailers. If I hadn't seen them, I'd have driven off and taken them with me. Right? He only found this little kid sitting in the wheel well by doing that. Now, when that truck fired up, was, was that kid got out? We don't know. All right? But if nothing else, this explains why you have to have policies and why you have to enforce them. If you see your driver just get in the cab and go, why didn't you do the circle of safety if you have that policy? So you have to enforce it. So the fleet policies, why do we have them? You just have to set the standards. The, you know, lay it out, what you want, what you expect of your drivers. That way, you can hold them accountable. You've got something to get onto them about. You know, You have to have something to say, these are our rules, you didn't do it. And it's consistent. <coughs> We're not even going to get into labor rules and everything else, all right? But consistency is key because you can't discipline one guy for doing something and then another guy who's your favorite driver does the same thing and you just, you know, it's all right, all right? You've got to be consistent. And it's to protect the company. It's the number one reason you're all here is to protect the company, all right? So... <coughs> Some of the issues that we've, that we've got now is that, and I, like I said, I've got a case study coming up, is, is you have a driver that gets into an accident, and it appears to be, you know, maybe it's the driver's fault or it's somebody else's fault, and it appears to be cut and dry. But then the attorneys start getting into it, and they start looking at different things. And they start seeing that maybe you shouldn't hire the driver in the first place. Do you have a written policy? Do you have a policy that states the qualifications for that driver before you hire them, all right? Did you have problems with the driver, but you kept them, all right? Did you give them loads that they shouldn't have? I don't know whether it be money or hazardous materials, explosives or whatever. Did you train them? And if you trained them and you didn't document it, it uh, you guys are finally waking up. <coughs> and then this is what you get hit with, okay? So here's a case study. You tell me who's at fault. And a driver, an employee was driving down the highway when he noticed a disabled motorhome partially blocking the road. So to avoid hitting the motorhome, the driver had to cross over the road's WL line. Can't do that, can you? You're not allowed to cross the WL line. The driver struck three vehicles after crossing the center lane, which resulted in severe injuries to two people. Who's at fault? The driver, all right? If he's going to cross, he better make sure there's, there's nothing coming. You can't just straddle a couple of WL lines. So if you get this call as a safety person or an operations person in trucking, you're going to say, all right, well, we've got some injuries. We better get this turned in to nationwide. All right. But look at the other things that, they, that was found once they started digging into it. The employer was accused of negligent hiring for failure to do a proper background check. So they didn't have, maybe they did a background check. Maybe they called the previous employer. Hey, how is this guy? It's not documented. Didn't happen. Because he was a convicted felon. Which doesn't mean you can't hire him. All right? There are companies that hire felons. The employee's driver's license had been previously suspended, which led to neg negligent hiring. Right? So now we've got two things that they're going to get you on. Retention and failure to train or supervise. All right, so we have no documentation. And then they found that uh, two of the brakes were out of adjustment. You've got uh, quite a few axles, quite a few brakes. Two brakes is really not going to make a difference if that vehicle is driven in a normal manner. They need to be adjusted correctly. But because they were found out of adjustment after they'd hit some vehicles, now you've got an issue. So 12 million plus... 3.5 million in damages for the trucking company not adequately uh, maintain, inspect, or repair trucks. 
it should have been a cut and dry. It's his fault, but then they start digging into everything else that the company did or didn't do. Okay? And it all adds up. So what are examples of good fleet policy? Because the number one right now for us is cell phone, and cell phone use includes texting. Okay? Don't, don't forget texting. I, I live up in, in between Sacramento and South Lake Tahoe. Right? And I, so it's a seven-hour drive. All I see is people driving, and their heads are like this. And it's not because they're falling asleep. It's because they're texting. It used to be this, but now the head's bob, right? There's a new public service announcement coming out about texting, letting everybody know the dangers of texting. Who is the most at fault for texting? Who, who does it more than anybody else? Everybody thinks that, don't they? Study shows it's us. Us in our 40s and 50s, right? It's us, and we should know better. <clears throat> so if we're driving with our kids, I've got a, a daughter that's 15 and so many weeks and days because she's counting till she's 15 and a half and she can drive. And if I'm driving and texting, what's she going to do? Right? Well, we're teaching our kids how to drive every time we drive with them. Right? Your policy should start off with something like this. Your condition of employment is to work safely. Right? without injury or accident. State it. You, this is what we want you to do. Uh, you, obviously, you can't go below the federal estate. You can go above federal estate, but they have to at least be a minimum of federal estate. And have them sign it. Have them read it. If, if, if you don't think they're going to read it, read it to them. Make sure they understand it. And have them sign it. This is what I know, understand. This is what's going to happen if I don't do this. All right? Have a company fleet safety policy statement laying out all of the rules and regulations. State what the hiring standards are. You know, what your minimum, uh, or sorry, your maximum points are on the DMV. Uh, how many jobs they're allowed prior. I mean, everybody here has people come in and they hand you an employment, or they ask for an employment app, and then when it comes to the previous employer, they ask for extra sheets. Because right, there's not enough room on the application. Maybe you've only got five, you know, and they need 20. Right? Those are the sort of things you need to be looking for. What's your minimum age? If you don't have a minimum age and you put somebody in that's underage, or you have a minimum age and then you put somebody in under, you're in trouble. Double-edged sword. And make sure you do annual reviews of motor vehicle records. Everybody who has a commercial driver in this state should be enrolled in the pull notice. Right? <laughs> the first one? Your, your fleet policy should start with that sort of statement. Something like, you, know, you can copy it if you want, but something like that. The, to work for ABC Trucking, we expect you to do it safely, without injury, to you or the motoring public or anybody else. And have them sign it. So if they get injured or if they have an accident, they're out of a job? Not necessarily. Then you go into <coughs> your, your policies as to what you're going to do. If you have a driver that comes to you and says, I just got a DUI, what are you going to do? I know what I would do when I was managing. They're out the door. Right? But if you don't have it written down, you don't have a policy and you fire one guy and you keep the other guy, you're opening it up. So do we hire our own problems? How many people of here have hired somebody and think, oh, God, I wish I'd... See? I wish I'd never hired that person, right? I always used to blame it on my, my managers, you know? Every employee would come through me. The manager would bring me the application and say, hey, he's a great driver, uh, you know, you're going to love this guy, right? So I'd go through it and go, okay, it looks, looks good. And then we have problems, and I always go, it was your fault. You're the one who hired him. All right? So who reviews the application? Write it down. Document it. You don't have to put a name. Just put a title because you know, people move around. So if it's a safety manager, just put safety manager. Don't put Stephen Boyle safety manager because if I leave, you know, what are we going to do? Review the MVR, the motor vehicle record. All right? If I come to you as a driver... Uh, give you an application, I have to bring an MVR, right? 
How old can it be? Hmm? Yeah, it goes back, well, you can go back seven or ten years. If I'm going to be hired today, my, my motor vehicle record can't be more than 30 days old. If they bring you one that's two months old, go, hey, I need a new one. I need one today. I need one that's less than 30, month, 30 days old, okay? Review the driver's license. It's amazing how many people have more than one driver's license. All right, when you start doing background checks, you'll find that some people have multiple driver's licenses in multiple states. You're supposed to surrender driver's licenses. And they'll give you the one with the least points on. All right? And make sure that uh, if you are felony friendly, I say that tongue in cheek, but if you are willing to hire people, make sure you document what you will and will not accept as, as a felony. All right? What's a major violation of driving vi violation? What's, I mean, what's, what's the biggest? DUI, right? I mean, it's going to cost you a fortune. All right? Speeding. Who said speeding? Speeding. Speeding is huge. In a truck, it's an aggressive driver. Right? But onto that, are you driving by the load? Are you paying by the load or are you paying by the hour? These are things you've got to think about. Am I paying my drivers to speed? Right? A, lot of, a lot of people still pay by the load, which is fine as long as you can control it. Major violations. So you've got somebody that comes in and they have a DUI. You're going to hire them. You can if you want. Yeah, I wouldn't. But you've got to have it written down. This is what our policy is. Right? And if you also have to have in the policy, uh, they, they come to you, I just got a DUI. Then, or okay, we'll sort it out. Define a minor violation. So if it's a moving violation, maybe uh, he's over in the, in, the, in the second lane. The CHP love that one right now, right? Everyone wants the trucks over in the right lane. When it's a busy area, the truck will move over one lane because of on and off ramps. It's a lot easier for them instead of changing lanes back and two. If it wasn't against the law, I'd have our trucks, well, the trucks I used to run, do that because I'd, it's a lot safer than trucks changing lanes all the time, okay? But you have to define them. This is what we class as a minor vi violation. Big one for us right now, one of the questions I ask all of our customers when I go in is, do you have company vehicles that employees can take home? I have a company vehicle. Right? I can take home. I'm allowed to use it on my, on my own time. My wife's allowed to drive it. But my son at 17 isn't because he has to be at least 21. Nationwide has set things that I'm allowed to do and not do with that vehicle, okay? Do you have people in your business that gets in the personal car and maybe runs the Staples or the donut shop or wherever, okay? Define the usage of it. Because you don't want them getting in an accident and they say, well, I was doing this for work and you don't have a policy for it and you don't, maybe you don't have coverage for it, all right? Make sure it's written down. And rental vehicles. You've got people that travel around. Define the usage. Make sure when I rent a car for Nationwide, I decline everything. I'm not supposed to take any. I work for an insurance company. Why would I you know, take in, in insurance out? Now, big one. So now you've hired your drive. You've done your background check and everything else. What do you expect from that? Lay out what you decide is the correct speed. Do you govern the trucks? All modern trucks now, you can govern them. You can set them to 55, but it doesn't mean they can't do 45 and a 25. Okay? So write it out. What do you expect? I was at a company, like I said, in Tuesday in Gilroy. They have it all over the walls. They're following distance. Every driver gets a copy of it. All right? They want everybody to know what their policy is on the following distance, which is great, as long as they make sure the drivers stick to it. And they actually go out and observe drivers. They record drivers. They have a little note, a little attaboy that they give the driver if they see them doing the right thing. And he said 90% of the time they're giving out attaboys. 10%, it's, it's a bad boy, all right? Rural road driving. I used to require all my tankers to run with the headlights on. 
on rural roads. Most accidents happen not on the freeway, but on the small roads. Right? Lane changing techniques. It, it, it sounds silly, but you, if you get these policies written down, and you, can, you have an a lane change accident, and it's kind of, we don't know who's at fault. They go, well, this is our policy, and this is what our drivers do every single time. All right? Everybody knows smog? Everybody heard smog? For, for lane change, write down smog. All right? So it's signal. Turn, turn your signal. Let everybody know what you're doing. Turn the signal on. Hey, I'm coming over. I'm making a left. My 65-foot, 40-ton vehicle is making a lane change. Yes. Yes, blind spots have been fairly eliminated as long as you put the convex mirror on the hood on the right. Right at the front, you ever, you ever see them? Big round mirror yeah. on the front of the, of the right fender that gives you a view all the way down that. Because the main blind spot for a truck driver is right here. The right side, right down there. Okay. All right, you got a little bit here, but if he turns his head, hello. Buses, well, buses now have those mirrors that you can put forward that actually stick further forward than the windshields, right? Or you can get lane monitoring devices to let you know there's something in, in there, right? No, you're shaking your head? No. They actually have radar now. You can put on, I, it's, I mean, it's all costly. The idea is that you try not to do as many lane changes as possible. All right. But if you have to, make sure that you have a policy. If you can't do uh, radar, if you can't change the mirrors, you've got to have a policy. Uh, when I drove, they didn't like those convex mirrors on the hood because they didn't think it made the truck look good. It was aesthetics. All right? And I kept on saying, but how many cars do we have to take out when we're making a right just because our truck looks good? Okay? But they wouldn't put them on. So you have to drive accordingly. You have to make sure. You have to take your time, not just turn signal, count to three, and start moving. All right? A lot of drivers do that. They put the turn signal on, right, I've given you warning, I'm counting to three, and I'm coming over. Get out of my way. All right? So smog is signal. Let everybody know what you're doing. Mirror. Obviously, check your mirror. O, over the shoulder if you can. This is the best thing for blind spots on the left. It's called a neck. Right? You turn it, and you look. And then go. So smog. Remember that one. Intersections. What's your policy? I had a slide which I, I didn't put in. Your policy for inter intersections. Your truck should not pull up to the limit line. Because the hood sits about here. Right? On most commercial vehicles. So your commercial driver's up here. He can't see the crosswalk. It's warm in here, isn't it? She's, yeah. Um, and I have a slide of this child in, <clears throat> in a wheelchair, and he was going across the crosswalk. And the driver came up to the light, the light was red, and he goes, okay, well, I just need to check my paperwork, I've got two more drops, I don't know what he was doing, okay? The light turns green, grabs the gear, away he goes. And then he, the wheelchair spins, the handles get stuck in the radiator grill, and he takes the kid for a three-block ride until people are honking the horn, flashing the lights. Kid was okay, had no tires left on his wheelchair, and he thought it was a better ride than Disneyland. But the driver was shook up, and I tell you, right now, he stops a car length back from that intersection. So you can see the intersection. So if you're going to do a policy like that, document it right, and train it. Bracking procedures. The number one cause of accidents in the trucking industry. UPS for a while looked at taking the reverse gear out of their trucks. Right? UPS is very, very good. If you ever want to learn how to do things, look at UPS. UPS routes all of their drivers to make as many right turns as possible. Why do you think we want to make a right turn rather than a left turn? Safer. Safer. Make a left turn, you have to cross traffic. 
So if you see UPS trucks and vans, 99% of the time they make rights. And they route them that way. They always make rights. Okay? Backing procedures. Everybody know what GOAL stands for? There's another one. Get out and look. It goes back to that circle of safety. When in doubt, get out. All right? And those are the sorts of things you need to tell the driver and have them written down. Turning techniques. <coughs> do we do U-turns in the middle of the road? We don't do U-turns in the middle of the road. Too many accidents happen. All right? what, are your, what are your policies? Passing techniques. Do we pass? If we're doing 55 and the truck in front of us is doing 54, do we pass? No, you just you back off one mile an hour. You're not going to get anywhere any quicker, okay? So write them down. What are your policies on interstate and freeway driving? Uh, do you require a certain stops after so many hours of driving? Or do you just say, you know what, you're allowed to drive 12 hours? Go for it. Just drive 12 hours. Right? Write these sorts of things down. What do you do in poor weather? At what point do you say to the driver, if the weather's that bad, I'm in the wrong area of the state for, for bad, bad weather, but up in my area with the snow, the Thule fog, at what point do you say to the driver, you tell me if it's that bad, you park the truck? Or do you tell them, I don't care, just keep on going? Okay? Because as soon as you just told the driver, you know, if the driver calls and says, look, it's, un it's unsafe out here, it's a blizzard, I've got chains on and I'm still slipping around, and you say, I don't care, that load needs to go, where did the liability just switch to? Company. Company. There is a new a terminology that I learned not too long ago. Uh, it's, where is it? Who wants to be a DFI? Yep, remember that one, right? DFI. That's a new, it's not CEO, not CFO, it's a DFI. That's the person in the company that's designated for incarceration. Right? You're the one that says, the load's got to go. It's got to go. You just became the DFI. And more and more, drivers and employers are going to jail. They're not just getting fined. Right? As people get mothers against truck, tired truckers and all this come along, they're really getting on it. Cell phones. Make sure you have a policy. You have to. Uh, I'm not saying this is a, it's a good idea. You have to have a cell phone policy or you're going to get hit with some major, major fines. About leaving a vehicle. Do you leave vehicles? I came obviously from the fuel industry. I do not want my drivers leaving a loaded tanker with 8,800 gallons of gasoline on. You know, maybe he went in to use the restroom and he's left it running because truck drivers love to hear the engines run. Right? They just leave them idling for hours and hours and hours. Just a waste of fuel. You might as well just put a sign on terrorists. Please take my vehicle and run it into a school. Right? What are your security for vehicles? Do you have hazmat? An 80,000 pound vehicle does not have to be carrying hazmat to become a lethal weapon. Okay? Rules of the road. It can be as basic as ABC trucking. There's nobody here from ABC trucking. Is there? I just make that one up. All right? ABC Trucking expects you to follow all state and federal rules and regulations. You've got to cover it. We used to haul, the company I worked for used to haul for BP. Uh, British Petroleum, that's, that's me. You know. <clears throat> and they used to drive me up the wall because they would say, do you have a, a speed limit policy? Yes, my policy states that all my drivers must follow all rules and regulations in the state that they're running. Oh, but we want it to say, we don't allow you to go over 55. I said, I just said that. Right? So it's, it's wording, but I had to put it in just for them. Don't even get me started on those guys. Illness and fatigue. <clears throat> if the driver comes to the dispatcher and said, I feel terrible. It's always on a Monday or a Friday, right? I feel terrible. I don't know if I can come in. I don't care. You need to go to work. Then they go have an accident. Who's at fault? Who's the DFI? The dispatcher becomes a DFI. There's a state bill that came out, SB 198, years ago. And that used to be uh, the person responsible for telling that driver to do something goes to jail. All right? So illness and fatigue. They may be ill. They may have not done what they're supposed to do and get plenty of rest and come to work ready to work. They may have been out 
may have gone to Vegas for three days. or I don't know. But if they are ill or fatigued, don't put them in. It doesn't matter if they have hours. If, they, if they've done the 34-hour restart and they're all ready to go and they've got 80 hours, or if you're in ag, 112, <coughs> excuse me, if they're ill or fatigued, you can't put them on the road. Passengers. How many people allow passengers? Right. Okay. Have it in the policy. Who are you allowed to take? You're allowed to take your spouse. You're allowed to pick up hitchhikers. You've got to put it in the policy. Okay. I would always tell my drivers, I don't have coverage pa for passengers. My general liability insurance covers the truck and anything you hit or any body you hit. If you get injured in an accident, my workers comp covers you, the driver. I don't have anything for passengers. The passenger then goes and sues us, and we've all got to change our names because now they own the company. All right? Because load securement. Make sure if you're doing flatbed work and all this, you know what the load securement, what the tie-down rules are, the regulations, they're always changing. Make sure you've documented it. What's your traffic violations? We already talked about that one. And let them know what your drug and alcohol policy is. Do you accept... If somebody comes to you and fails a random, do you keep them? Do you put them through uh, the follow-up testing and everything else that they have to go through? Anybody do that? I didn't. Personally, I didn't. If they failed, they were out. Okay? But it's entirely up to you. Accident reporting. The worst thing you can do as being somebody in safety is for a driver to call you up and go, oh, I forgot to tell you, a week ago... I had this accident, and uh, I didn't have a camera with me, and I forgot to write it all down, but I just want to let you know. Or you get a call from somebody, your driver just hit me, blah, 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 you know, and you, nobody knows, right? What is the reporting? Because if you have an accident in this state, and you can call out the highway patrol, you better get that police report, right? The CHP report is gold. Uh, I don't know about down here, up in the north, a lot of cities in the Bay Area won't even write reports anymore. Uh, the last time I got on the phone with the uh, San Jose Police de uh, Department, and I said, I've got an accident involving a tanker, loaded with fuel, no injuries. I need a police report. We don't do police reports anymore. We don't do accident re reports. I said, well, I need somebody to come in. If there's no injuries, change information, that's why you pay high insurance rates. That's exactly what the officer said to me. So at that point, what are you going to do? I mean, I can't argue with the guy. So you got to be careful. You, know, you only may, you only, the only thing you may be able to get is information from the other people. But make sure your driver knows what to get. If you can't go out to the accident, you better make sure that they're getting the right pictures, the right information, uh, pictures of the other vehicle involved, how many occupants of that vehicle, because it's amazing how many people get in an accident with one ver person in that car. Two days later, there's three at the chiropractor. Okay? So you've got to make sure they know all this sort of stuff and what to do. And if they call, if a driver calls your dispatch, does your dispatch know what to do? If the dispatch then calls the safety manager, does the safety manager know what to do? You've got to follow it all the way down. Uh, we already covered that one. Reporting citations. We all get annual motor vehicle reviews, right? Every year, on every driver, you get an MVR from the DMV because you got the pull notice. Unless there's activity on the record, then the DMV, which is overstaffed and overpaid, will always send you a notice stating this driver on this day got this. But it's usually about three or four months after the fact. Now, you get a driver that in his personal vehicle get the DUI, but by law, he's only required to, uh, to tell his employer if he gets convicted. So he gets a DUI, he gets an attorney. How long is it going to take before he goes to court and gets convicted and everyone else? Six months? A year? So you've got a driver that hasn't told you, and he's driving for six months to a year with a possible DUI conviction. Do you want him on the road? That guy gets into an accident, and he's found to be intoxicated. You don't have a leg to stand on. Okay? 
So your policy needs to be above the state and federal. You need to stay within 24 hours, and that's it is for, for nationwide. If I get a, 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 sorry, a citation within 24 hours, I have to notify my supervisor, regardless of whether I get convicted or not. Okay? So any, one person knows CSA? Anybody heard of CSA? Wow. Okay. Remember, the people with DOT numbers, you're in this now. People with just CA numbers, you're going to be in it. So there's no hiding from it. And this is public information. Anybody can access it. And it's the federal government. It's the compliance, safety, and accountability. And it, it tracks all carriers by certain specific areas, right? It used to be that if a carrier had a bad accident, a fatality, and the DOT comes in to do an investigation, uh, I had the DOT come into a company I was at, not for a fatality, they just knocked on the door. And I believe it was, I'm not sure, but I believe it was a disgruntled employee that called them up and said, hey, you need to check this place out. And here they come knocking on the door. Now, we had 95 trucks, a couple of hundred drivers. They were there for 10 days. Uh, I was not supposed to be at that corporate office for more than two days. Okay? I had to go home on the weekend, repack, and come back. Ten days to go through drug and alcohol, uh, hours of service, all the driver files, all the trucks. And there was three of them. Uh, at that time, I used to smoke, and I went through a lot of cigarettes. Okay? I used to try to stunt my, my growth. It really didn't work. But now what they're doing is they're splitting it all up. All right? So now we have unsafe driving, hours of service, driver fitness, and driver fitness is medical cards, driver's license. It may, it may not be that the medical cards expire. They may not just have them on them. All right? Controlled substance, which is obviously uh, drugs and alcohol, maintenance, and then the hazardous, and the crash indicator is not public, except the federal government didn't hire the right people because if you click on it, it goes right in. All right? even though you're not supposed to be able to see it. And they score every company nationwide on these. So their idea is if they have a company, let's see, we've got 60% driver fitness. So they're, like, well, you know, they're getting a little high here. I believe the intervention threshold is about 70 or 75%. They send you a letter. Hey, We've noticed that your drivers are getting pulled over a lot because they don't have the right required documentation. Or you, Don't start yawning on me. I, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> and they focus just on that. So it's trying to save them money and time. Right? If you don't fix it, that's when they come in. They won't look at anything else. They'll just look at that. So it's a little easier for everybody. Right? So here's a trucking company. Nobody in here, this is nobody in here, right? And those are their scores. Not very good. Trust me, uh, I've been to some companies where it's less than 1% on all of them, and that's what you want, okay? But they've got hit on vehicle maintenance. Now, when you go into this website, you can then click on any of these and open them up. And if we go to unsafe driving, the threshold for the feds coming in is 65%. They're at 53%. And then it lists all of the tickets. Look at that. Total number of violations, 976. Failing to obey traffic control devices. That's running a red light normally. Okay. It's 378 for seatbelt. Failing to use the seatbelt while operating a commercial vehicle. What's the number one way that a commercial truck driver is killed in an accident? It goes back to the old lug nut rule. Anybody know the lug nut rule? The one with the most lug nut wins. So if an 18-wheeler hits a car, the 18-wheeler usually wins. If an 18-wheeler hits a train, the train usually wins. Right? The more lug nuts, the most. Most truck drivers who get involved in accidents survive because they're in a truck, unless they don't have the seatbelt on and they get ejected. And that's the number one cause of death for truck drivers. Easy fix for that, you've got, you can now order trucks with fluorescent orange or green seatbelts. So even if they're wearing a shirt like this and the seatbelt's on, you can see it. Some drivers got pretty tricky, though. They borrowed from uh, 
Caltrans, the orange shirts, and you put them on, so now you can't see the seatbelt. So now you've got to switch them to the old type seatbelt. Seat you, uh, you can drill down even further into this and find out which truck got what violation, when, where, who, how, what. If you have a login for your company, you can find the, the driver and everything else. Here's hours of service. 122, because the onboard device, they were running electronic logs, wasn't, wasn't working. Okay? The, th the threshold, again, is 65%. Driver fitness, what do we got here? Operating commercial vehicle without a commercial driver's license. That's not a very good one. The CHP kind of frowns on that a little bit. Drug and alcohol, 39.5%. 26. Possession or under the influence of alcohol four hours prior to duty. That's not a good one. Okay, so you're not allowed to have... For a commercial driver, what blood alcohol level? 0 0.04. 0 0.04. 0 0.04 is a DUI. If a driver gets pulled over and he's got alcohol in his system, he's 0 0.04 or above, he's got a DUI. If he's in his personal vehicle, it's 0 0.08. Doesn't follow him with his license. A lot of drivers think that, okay? But it doesn't follow him. But you're not allowed to use alcohol four hours before. So they, they'll, they'll put you out of service. If you're under 0.04, you won't get a DUI, but you'll get put out of service for 12 hours. So they had 39.5% doing that. Vehicle maintenance. Here we have 90. Mud flat missing or defective. Now, if, if you were coming into this information, what would you go do? You'd go knock on the maintenance and go, hey, what's going on with the mud flaps? Right? I got 90 tickets with mud flaps. I think there's a problem. Do you check mud flaps? You know, are the drivers backing up and ripping them off all the time? This is the sort of thing that you, as operators, can look at and say, I got a problem with mud flaps, right? Or I got a problem with uh, seatbelt use, things like that. So it's a good tool for you to use. You can look at and de determine where you need to look, where you need to put your efforts. Hazmat compliant. Anybody do hazmat here? Good. Perfect. Crashes. Again, you can click on here. You can get the information on the accident, who it was, when it was, how many vehicles involved, things like that. It doesn't get you a police report. Yeah. I have no idea. No, I mean, it's, 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 yes, yes. Uh, when you go into the main site, which is uh, the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administ Administration site, SafeStat is, is a really good way of going in. The old version was SafeStat. So you go to safestat.org, go into that, and then to get your information, you put your DOT number. And then the California people that don't go into state you will get a DOT number, and then you'll plug that in, and you'll be able to check it. That's coming. I don't know when, but it is, it is coming. There are advantages that you can manage your issues. Your competitors can see your issues. So, you know, it works. Well. But you can see theirs, too. Right? You know, if you want, you can say, well, I wouldn't hire them, because look at what, look at what they did, you know, and you can bring it all up. Right? So we can get more in-depth. Here's an accident, all right? Uh, we know where it happened in Georgia. He's a driver only. Uh, this is the stuff that he got, possession or under the influence of alcohol, excessive weight, and an unauthorized passenger. And you're like, well, wait a minute, I have a, I have a no passenger rule. Who's the passenger? All right? So you can start looking at this. Yeah. What time frame is on this? 24 months. 24. And it, every month, you lose a month. So it's 24 months, just go on, all right? And your scores change every month, depending on whether you've gone up or down, right? But nobody told you that they had passengers. Who's the passenger? Yeah. Um, okay. Are these reports solely based on incidents in your company vehicle, or does it follow the driver and that person? Company vehicle. Okay. It's, it's attached to the DOT number, okay? There is another completely different system called the PSP, pre-screening pre process, which the feds now do, which tracks drivers. And you can log in, and you can actually look at the drivers. It doesn't, it's not like a DMV record. 
It shows you all of the scale activity, how many out of services he had. I mean, uh, it's nothing to do with moving vi violations. It's all how the driver did. So he comes to you when you're doing your employment. So, you know, how are you doing? How do, you, do you do a pre trip? And, oh, yeah, I do a pre trip. I make sure everything's great. Then you pull up a PSP, and every time we went through a scale, you got an out of service. Well, either the maintenance issues or he's not looking. All right? So you can track them that way. And then you can break it down into a history. Here we have from 727 to 1214, and we can see that the unsafe driving went from 40% to 53%. We're we'll going the wrong way. All right? We're trending the wrong way. So we, maybe we need to have some driver's meetings. Maybe we need to have somebody come out and do a safe driving. Every insurance company has a version of safe driving, a Smith system or whatever. Right? I mean, Nationwide has one. Okay, if it's not documented, they remember. All right. So now we've tracked the company. Now we've, uh, we've got our policies written. We're all ready to hire drivers. Now, hiring drivers is easy. Everybody can find drivers, right? Everyone can find drivers. Can you find good drivers? That's the problem, right? So documentation, is, it's, the, it's, the, it's the number one thing that you need to learn from here. All prospective drivers must have, before you put them on the road, a drive test. I don't know how many times I go through driver qualification files, there's no drive test. Oh, well, yeah. Joe out of dispatch took him for a drive. Did it happen? No, it's not documented. All right? Documented drive test. Pre-employment drug screen. Do not put them in the vehicle until they, you've got the result. Don't send them. I was at a company a while ago, and they were kind of split. They had two offices. One guy did the hiring, sent them for the pre-employment. The other office got the results. The other office never told the other guy. He just assumed that if he didn't get a call from the office going, oh, my God, they just failed, that it was good to put him on the road. How does he know? They could have failed, and somebody went, oh, we failed, and filed it, right? So make sure that you've got a documented drug screen, and obviously it's a negative. Background check, at least three years. You've got to go back three years of employment, okay? But you've got to have 10 years of history. So that employment form, that's why I used to have drivers coming in asking for extra sheets, because over 10 years, they may have worked at 20 different places. Okay? So 10 years of history. If you don't have 10 years, why? You know, if he gives you all of his history and uh, there's three years missing, why? Well, I had a family emergency. I left work. I went back to Idaho or wherever to look after my parents. Great. Document it. Make sure you write it down. Make sure the application is completed and it's signed. And then you get to the driver qualification files. Everybody have driver qualification files? Yeah. You do? Oh, I, I thought you asked a question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so driver qualification. This is the biggest area that I see issues with. And it's the simplest one to do. What I, the way I had a driver's file is I had a folder a bit like this that had the 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 two prongs on either side where you can fold them over, okay? One side I would keep permanent files. Everything that stays in the driver's file. It never goes out, it never changes. On my left, on my right, I had the rotating. All the stuff that changes with expiration dates. When the CHP comes in, open it, here you go. He can look at the employment application and all this sort of stuff on one side and then make sure that everything's up to date on the right. You can keep it however you want. There is no requirement of how to keep a driver's file. You can hand it to them in all sorts of files. You can you know, just give them a stack of paper if you want. As long as everything that is required is in there, they don't like it as much. Okay? Well, let's talk about what shouldn't be in there. This is a DOT, a Department of Transportation driver file. So we don't need insurance papers. We don't need all the write-ups that you're giving the driver because he backed over things. Right? We don't need wage stubs. We don't need I-9 showing that he is legal in the country to work. 
doctor's excuses and anything else. Nothing like that. That should all be in HR. Right? So you have two files. HR file, driver's file. A driver's file literally should be maybe this thick. Last place I went to, it was like, I mean, it's just pages and pages of stuff, okay? So what do we need? Permanent items, which I had on the left. Permanent items is your application. You have an application signed with 10 years of history. A background check. How far back do you have to go? Three years. Very good. Three years. It is your responsibility to try and do a background check. All right? So you're, you're checking for previous drug use, positive tests, and if you can, uh, previous employment information. Not most, most employers, all they do is answer the yes, they work from this time to this time, and they were fine on drug. That's about all you get. Some others don't send you anything. You're required to attempt. You don't have to go knock on the door. The CHP, their responsibility when they come in and see that you did a background check or you tried and you have the facts with the uh, confirmation sheet from the facts showing you sent it or you mailed it and you mailed it, uh, thank you, certified, that you've got the documentation. It's their job then to go knock on the door of the company you tried to get it from and say, how come you didn't do it? Right? Very, very rare that they have to do that. Initial MVR, so they bring you a DMV printout. I've got a copy of a DMV printout on here. Make sure that it has at the bottom the word end because sometimes they're two and three pages long. And if you don't have end, you don't have all the sheets. And they'll bring you the first sheet that just has, it's all nice and clean, it looks great, but they don't have the end bit with all the violations on it. Okay, so make sure it has end on it. Make sure you take them a road test. It doesn't have to be 50 miles of freeway driving. It could be five miles. When I test drove tanker drivers, I never took them on the freeway. Freeway is the easiest place to drive. Everybody's going the same way. I took them on the rural roads around Sacramento, all right, making left turns and right turns and over railroad tracks because we have to stop at railroad tracks for hazmat. Okay? It's amazing how many people on a road test don't stop at railroad tracks. Pull notice release. To put them in the pull notice, you have to have a release for them to sign. Everybody do that? And the driver proficiency form, which means that you have checked them off. You know that they're good to operate the vehicles that you operate. Don't check them off in a pickup and say that they can drive an 18-wheeler. That's not a proficiency form, right? This is the proficiency form. So you're stating, and this is a California only. This is not federal. Federal does not require this. They just need the drive test is that they're good for a straight truck or a tractor trailer or doubles or tank. Or you can put any way you want. You can list any vehicle you want, but make sure that you have, they demonstrate to you that, yes, they can operate this piece of equipment. Because if you've sent them out in a piece of equipment that you haven't checked them off on, who's the DFI again? It's one of you guys, right? So on the right side, rotating items, stuff that needs to switch. Driver's license, six buyers, mine is six buyers, all right? So make sure the driver's license that you have is current and up to date. I used to run a spreadsheet with all the drivers, and I had the expiration dates, medical expiration dates, and driver's license expiration dates, and I formatted it so six, 60 days before the expiration date, it would turn, the expiration date would turn red. So once a week, I'd pull up, and I'd go, okay, I need to get this, this, and this. You know, but I had couple hundred drivers, so you got to keep a check on these things. Because the driver, you'll call them up and say, hey, your driver's license has expired. Do you have a new one? Oh, yeah. Well, I need a copy of it. Okay, well, you know, I'll get it to you. And it's about a week later. Hey, so, you know, and maybe they haven't paid child support or something, and their driver's license has not been issued yet. All right? You just put them out on the road, you're liable. Your, medical, your motor vehicle uh, review, make sure that you've got a copy of that in there, and it's signed. A list of certificates of violations signed by the driver. That is a federal, okay? Because the federal does not recognize the pull notice. I found that out the hard way when the DOT, uh, yeah, I had the DOT in, and they said, 
I need a list, a certificate, a list of violations signed by the drivers stating every 12 months, this is the violations they got or they're clean. I go, well, I don't have that. I have the pull notice. It doesn't matter because they don't recognize it. They'd love to have everybody to have the pull notice, but they don't recognize it. So if you're a federal, if you have a DOT number, you've got to have that one too. Okay? Or as well. Medical. Do you have to keep the long form? Or just a copy of the green card? It's, it's kind of switching. There are privacy issues with the medical long form uh, where we're now saying all you need is a copy of the front and back of the green card. The green card being the certificate that the driver carries. Okay? Because there are medical records on the long form. Everybody I know keeps a copy of the long form. But with HIPAA, you know, we're now saying you, you may not want to keep the long form. You only need a copy of of the green. That's still in right it's still in debate. It's still in debate about keeping the yes, yes. I, w I always kept a long form because I had drivers that lost their green card, you know, their wife or, okay, husband, sorry, uh, put them through the washing machine and they got shredded, right? So they need a new one. So I'd provide them the long form and they'd go to the doctor and the doctor give them a new one, right? So they have to pay for it again. Uh, hazmat test, if applicable, couple, couple. Anybody recognize this guy? Anybody old enough to recognize this guy? Okay. So you need a copy of the driver's license. I grew up in England, but I used to watch all the John Wayne movies, all right? So my theme here is John Wayne, all right? Uh, so obviously his expires, because his expires in 1981. Well, actually he's expired, but that's the point. So we got a copy of the driver's license. Now we have an NBR, okay? So here they come, and this is what you're going to be looking for. That little word right there. If it doesn't have an end on it, you don't have all the sheets. Got to have an end. All right? And I doctored this one. I don't know if you can see it. We've got John Wayne. Okay? And he's got a clean record. And we're going to check for the date that it was issued because it can't be older than 30 days from... If I get the employment application and I have a higher date and it's past 30 days from this, this isn't... Good. It's got to be within 30 days. Okay? Make sure the driver's license number matches the driver's license that they just gave you. Okay? Make sure that they have the right endorsements and the medical is good. It's a good job to make sure that, you know, if they have a class A, class B, if they can do doubles, triples, or tanks, or whatever you're looking for. But that's the big one. Look for the end. You may have multiple sheets. Okay? This is the certificate of violations that the feds require. This is because they don't recognize a pull notice. So if you have a DOT number, you have to have this form annually. It doesn't have to be January 1st. It could be any day of the year. But every year, the driver has to fill this out. I got a ticket on this date for this, driving this, and here. Sign it. Gives it to the safety person. Whoever's going to do it, signs it. Reviews it. Okay? There's your medical card. Make sure that it's good, that the date's good, okay? How, well, how long do we have to keep logbooks? Six months. Six months. Seven months. The month you're working on, put right. Do we keep 12 months if we, if we want to? What happens if you have 12 months of documentation? Then you have to show the 12 months. Then they can get it, right? If you don't have to keep something... Sling it. I'm not saying that everybody here is forcing drivers to go over hours, never know. But there's no reason to give them more information, and I say them, as in the CHP or the feds, than they need. If they want logbooks, you give them six months of logbooks. Okay? So logbooks. So this is record retention. Six months, no more. After that, sling them. Throw them out. Shred them, whatever you want. Anybody run electronic? Uh, I used to run electronic. I loved it. I mean, it was great. And every six, you know, every, at the beginning of every month, that last month was deleted. I couldn't get it. It's gone, right? Driver vehicle inspection reports. Every driver, before they take the vehicle on the road, has to do a vehicle inspection report, right? What do they have to legally sign, the post trip or the pre trip? They're legally documenting a post trip. They have to show they did a pre-trip, but when they sign it, 
the saying they did a post trip. How long have we got to keep those full? Very good. 90 days. Do we keep 120 days? Do we keep 120 days where the driver's written up bad brakes, bad brakes, bad brakes for the last... See, she keeps laughing because she's had the same issue, haven't you? You've had the same issues, yes, I know. Uh, do we tell our drivers when they do a pre-trip inspection if the radio doesn't work? Do they need to write that up? Yeah, it needs to be on a separate piece of paper. Or go tell, all right? It's safety. It's stuff, stuff to do with the truck being safe to go on the road. Wheel missing. Brakes are out of adjustment. All right? AC not working written up 20 times. That, just, you need, that needs to be addressed on a different piece of, piece of paperwork. All right? Driver qualification files, how long do we have to keep them for? Well, obviously, when the driver's employed with us, we've always got to have one up to date. But if the driver leaves or we fire the driver, I mean, the... I used to, my, my temp, temptation when I got rid of a really bad driver was to get that file and just round file it. Oh, hell, thank God, he's gone, right? But you can't do that. You've got to keep him three years. Because if he goes somewhere else and gets into an accident, they're coming after your records too, right? So make sure they're right. Even though he's gone, make sure your records are right. And if they're not, make sure they're right once he's gone, all right? Full notice. See, there's my theme again. Here's John Wayne. And if that, that's supposed to be John Huston. Anybody a John Wayne fan? He was the director of John Wayne movies. Anyway, when you get a pull notice from a driver, review it. Don't just look at it. Oh, a pull notice. Put it away. Right? You have to sign it. You have to sign it and date it. Because if you don't do that, it didn't happen. Right? And make sure that you've got the right driver uh, and the expiration date and the expiration date of his medical, uh, hazmat endorsement if he's, if he's got it, and sign and date it, and file it. If you don't do that, you didn't look at it. You can look at every single one of them, but if you don't sign and date it, you didn't do it. Okay? How many people have been through a bid inspection? Everybody enjoy their bid inspections? Most of them are. I mean, I've been through lots of them. I mean... I, I haven't had any issues, but then I haven't had a lot of them issues for them to find. Uh, it can go very well, or it can go very bad. It depends what they find. If they start finding stuff, the CHP is not like the DOT. Uh, I was at a company where the DOT, they had, I had two in inspectors. One found a driver went, he was, allowed, he was a federal driver, so he was allowed to drive 11 hours. And he went 11 hours and 15 minutes. And that was to get the truck to a safe haven, hazmat, off the road in a truck stop instead of parking on the side of the road. And that's how I explained it to him. We got a $2,000 ticket for one driver. Okay? CHP doesn't work that way. The CHP are looking for trends. If you've got one guy that goes 15 minutes over, they'll make a little note of it. And if you've got another one, they'll make a note of that. Another one, another one. And that's when they, that's when they start digging. If they see one and nothing else, nothing's going to happen. Don't quote me on that. All right. But the inspection categories, what they're looking for, they're going to look at regulated vehicles. A regulated vehicle is what? Hmm? Well, you're, you're, you're obviously from the busing side. Yes, yes. Regulated vehicles for commercial vehicles, trucks, is 26,001 pounds or more. Okay. They're going to look at the maintenance records. They're going to want to see if you do provide the maintenance. And if you do check the driver's write-ups, if the driver did write up that he's only got um, a single tire on one axle and he's supposed to have two and he's written it up five times and you just keep sending them out, that's when they're going to hone in and start asking, asking questions. They're going to look at driver records. That's the driver qualification files. They're going to look to see if you did a background check. All right? They're going to look to see if you've got an MVR that was within 30 days of the hire date. This is the sort of things that they hone in on. Okay? If you're hazmat, then they start looking at security plans and all this. But we don't have any hazmat, so we won't even go there. Unsatisfactory conditions, the sort of things that you're going to get. If you, they come out and inspect your vehicles 20% or more, you failed. If you have a fleet of two and one fails, you failed. And you have a fleet of three, you know, 
one fails, you still got 30%. Okay, so 20% or more you're, are out of service. The CHP, uh, like the DOT, are trying to switch, trying to get uh, more efficient. So if your truck has been through a scale and got a CES, uh, CVSA sticker, you know the sticker that goes in the window? If you have a current sticker, they will note the sticker and not inspect the truck. So the best thing, if you've got a bin special coming up, run your truck through the scales. Get, get the stickers, then they don't have to even look at the trucks. If you're non-hazmat, you can do, well, all they do is look at documentation anyway. If you're hazmat, they go look at the trucks. All right? But if they're going to look at trucks, get them all stickered and they don't have to look at it. Uh, if your vehicle equipment violations uh, of a deliberate or long-standing nature, if it's obvious that you're running a fly-by net operation that is going to cause issues, they're going to have issues. Okay. If you abuse the regulations, if uh, you have no regard for them, they are going to fail you. Okay. And it's not one. Like I said, the feds, it's individual. It's every single violation gets written up. With the CHP, they're looking for a trend. And if you have any issues with the vehicles and it's been written up and you just keep running them. Okay? This is the sort of thing. Can anybody see this? This is sort of, these, these are taken at CHP scales. This is a brake pot. This is called a spring brake. It has a very, very big spring in here. And the CHP, with their infinite sense of humor, said that it's a non-manufactured hole, all right? which means that it's rusted and it's split open. There's a big spring in there, which if that came off, would literally take your, your, your head off. All right? So those are the sort of things they find. This is a brake drum. This brake drum should be up here, all right? but it cracked and fell off at the scale. If the driver says to the officer, <laughs> it was fine when I left. The officer going to believe them? How many people have uh, owner responsibility cards in the trucks? Nobody? You can fill out a card. It's on the website. Yeah? I'm sorry, repeat that again? Owner responsibility cards. If you go onto the CHP's website, there's a little document you can fill out. ABC Trucking says that if my truck goes through a scale or gets pulled over and there's, it's overweight, and you can check which ones you want to accept responsibility for. If there's a maintenance issue, overweight, give the ticket to the company, not the driver. Right? You can accept responsibility. If he's caught speeding, the <laughs> responsibility card does not work. Right? It's only for things that they check at the scale. If they find, oops, oh god. If they find that, the, and the driver waves the responsibility card, the officer is probably going to say, yeah, I don't care. You're getting the ticket. Because you should have found that on pre-trip. You don't expect your drivers to climb underneath, wear coveralls, and get on creepers. But you can see that axle from the other side of the truck. And you better see that brake drum hanging out or cranked or whatever. Okay. Again, in the <coughs> infinite wisdom, no tread on stair axle. There's no tire, never mind a tread. All right? But these are the sort of things that come through. Tire is flat. If they get a ball tire, ball tires do not go flat or bald from the yard to the scales. Uh, they've taken a while to 80, 80,000, 50 to 60,000 miles for that tire to go bald. So you can't plead, well, I don't know. I had plenty of tread when I left, right? So the maintenance records. Driver's vehicle in uh, daily vehicle inspection. Remember, they must be signed. And when a, when a driver signs his report, he's signing his post trip. He also has to review the one before. So if you slip seed or you've got other drivers, if a driver, somebody else drove that truck prior, your next driver comes in, he has to review their DVIR and sign that one. There should be two sections for signatures. Stating that you've reviewed the person who drove it prior. Even if it's the same driver, they have to review their own. Okay, so they sign that one and fill it in. So they're going to look at the DVIR so make to see if there's trends. Like I said, if they're writing up the same things over and over again, they're going to look at the preventive maintenance. Do you have a written preventive maintenance program? We go back to written policies again. 
what sort of safety inspections are done and what sort of uh, maintenance and lubrications are, are or what do you write down what do you have on your forms what do you say you want the mechanics to look check and lubricate right you got to document it so DVIRs, shall, uh, all drivers shall perform the vehicle inspections and submit re written reports. And you've got to keep them. Those DVIRs got to be kept for 90 days. Okay? No more. And that, <clears throat> again, the preventive maintenance, this is what they're looking for. They're looking to make sure that the carrier is keeping the vehicles safe to go on the road. If you are in any other state, other than a, a New York and a couple of other states. But you run federal. Anybody know how often you have to inspect? Because we have to do every 90 days, right? Every 90 days, the most, every 90 days, a truck and trailer has to come in and get inspected and documented. That's, we, we call it the bit, right? If you're running federal, you have to do it once a year. You only have to document an inspection, a safety inspection, once a year. CHP is a little bit stringent, yeah. So every 90 days, a bit regulated vehicle, all others, pickups and this sort of stuff, it's all thrown in, all right? They aren't going to give you tickets for that, but they want to see that any vehicle that you operate is safe. And the retention of safety inspections of, of the vehicles for two years. So if you go through a scale, you get a, an inspection, two years. Unsatisfactory conditions, no maintenance records. Well, we did all of the oil changes, and we did the brakes, and we did the tires, but we don't have any records. You're going to get an uns unsatisfactory. And again, it's violations spread over. They're not going to look at one truck. If you missed a 90-day inspection, you know, you went 95 days, it's, it's okay. Don't forge the documentation if you find it. If you've got a bid inspection coming up, what I used to do is a pre-audit. I'd audit myself, okay? And if I found something, you know, I, I hope he doesn't find it. But don't alter it. You're better off letting, if they find it, saying, you know what, I found it myself, I know about it, this is what we've done to fix it, it won't happen again. It's a lot better that because if they find out, if they can figure out, and they're very good because they've heard it all before, that you've doctored it, then they start digging. And it, and they don't like it. So driver records, they're going to look at all your driver records. They're going to pull a sample of your records. What's always happened with me is they say, give me a list of all your drivers. So I print out a list of the drivers, and they circle. They just randomly circle. Right, give me these driver's records. So I pull all the driver's records. Right? They're going to look at the pull notice records. Because see, in California, you better have everybody in the pull notice. Right? Within 30 days of you hiring them, they better be in the pull notice. That's why the pull notice can't be older than 30 days, right? And then logbooks or time cards or whatever system you use to track the time. Okay, so motor carriers should require each driver to demonstrate the driver is capable of safely operating different types of vehicles. So that's when we go back into that form. So they're looking for that. That's California only. That it's yawning again, all right? And you've got to show which vehicles that they are capable of operating. And don't put them out in one that they're not until you check them off. As much as the load needs to go and the customer needs a load, don't send them out on the road. Okay? So again, that's the driver proficiency for. Make sure it's filled in. Make sure it's in the file. Okay? Who needs to be in the pull notice? Everybody. Okay? Casual drivers and drivers who have been employed for less than 30 days, you've got, the pull, you've got the printout, so they're good for 30 days. Anybody over 30, get them in the pull notice. There are multiple ways now of doing it. You can do the old-fashioned way of filling out the form and mailing it to the DMV, and then six months later, you get their first pull notice. There are online programs now. I used to use a company that uh, I put the information in online, and the next day, they emailed me the pull notice. You know, I can't endorse anybody, but there are plenty of people out there that to do that. Okay, so the pull notice, you need to at least every 12 months check the record. And that's why the pull notice was brought out. Right? So every 12 months you can do it. 
and you must sign and date to show that you did it. I have two cameras now. Okay. Motor carriers should keep copies of all, uh, all of your time records and any documentation that supports that for six months. What other documentation do we have other than a logbook? If they find logbook violations, then they start asking for fuel receipts. They start asking for maybe motel receipts if you've got people that are staying. Uh, then they start, then they got a nice little program where they can plug in mileage and say, well, wait a minute, he's got a really long fuel hose if his logbook says that he was in Portland, Oregon, sleeping, but he fueled in Bakersfield. That's a long fuel hose, okay? Those are the sort of things that they're looking for. Anything that can uh, sub substantiate where that vehicle is and where that driver is and what that driver is doing needs to be kept, okay? Regardless. Unsatisfactory, if you're going to get, don't put people in the pull notice. They don't like that. Right? You've got to keep them in the pull notice. Failure to maintain records. Maybe you don't keep them right, or after they've gone, you've, you've, or they've fired, you've thrown it. You've got to keep them. Right? The CHP now uh, are sending out little, little emails with a list of all of the documentation and stuff that they're going to check and look at. And some of them will send out uh, previous employees. We want to see a list of all the employees you used to have. So you better have those, those records to go with it. Um, driver's hours of service, obviously, they're going to put you out of, they're going to give you an unsatisfactory. And that's, that's the big one. Don't falsify. Okay? If you've got a problem, fix it. They may not find it. And then you fixed it, and you can go on. But if, if you have a problem, you find it, you fix it, and then, like I said, then you, you, you explain it if they, if they find it. If you can write that down, that, is a, that gives you a great list of everything that the CHP is going to look for. It's the terminal manager's compliance checklist, and it lists everything that they're going to ask for. It doesn't mean to say they're going to. It's what they can ask for. Do they check drug and alcohol? How do they check drug and alcohol? Most of the time, all they say is, do you have a drug and alcohol program? And you say, yes, I do. And that's it. Because it's federal. Drug and alcohol is federal. It is not state. Some of them will dig into it, but most of them will just, will just ask you. Oh, look, drug and alcohol. What do you know? <coughs> Everybody enrolled in a drug and alcohol program? Because you have commercial drivers, right? Okay. You have a driver like that? <laughs> I want to know where she got that. Okay. I had to switch. Actually, uh, prior to coming here, I sent a copy of my presentation to the guys here at Barclay. I didn't have that picture in there. Because I had to send it through Des Moines, Iowa, where Nationwide is, and I don't put that in there. I put it in afterwards, Okay. <clears throat> okay, so anybody with a commercial driver's license who operates 26,001 pounds or more must be in a drug and alcohol program. It's not an option. You can add, you can put people who drive pickups, company cars, sales staff, whoever you want, but the DOT drivers need to be separate. All right, 26,001 pounds or more, one list. Everybody else in another list, okay? What about dispatch, maintenance? Anybody that does a safety sensitive, I had my dispatchers in it because they were dispatching hazardous materials. And after 9-11, I, I tested everybody because I didn't want anybody saying anything about us. Okay? Test time. I told you there's going to be a test. The test is, if it's not documented, everyone passed. Any questions? Well, that's my favorite slide. Everybody can laugh at this one. Thank <laughs> you.